screen. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. So I'll, uh, we have some other, uh, we have a question uh, from Brian Wang. And so at the full 100,000 joules using deuterium, would there be a need for radiation shielding? Um, yes, we have radiation shielding. Um, I guess you sort of couldn't see it as I was running in to fix things. But actually, we have three feet of concrete surrounding the experimental room. This was a special wall that was built. Um, and the door also was blocked with this material, boratron, which is ordinary polyethylene saturated with boron. Boron-10, the other natural isotope of boron, happens to be a very strong neutron absorber. So the, the total shielding factor is about a factor of 3,000. At the amount of radiation we're producing now, it's almost unnecessary. But if we go up as we expect to another uh, couple of orders of magnitude and produce about 100 times more neutrons than we're producing now, then the shielding is, is quite essential. Um, the other shielding that's quite essential is that the whole inside of the uh, experimental chamber is lined with copper mesh. Our machine is quite a good radio broadcaster. It produces a huge electromagnetic pulse of radio radiation, which of course doesn't do us any harm, but has the capacity of burning out all sorts of sensitive electronic equipment. So we've shielded against that in many different ways. And uh, if we can move the camera, can we? Uh, even though we have this shield, there's enough electromagnetic radiation gets through that we need to shield our instruments again with ordinary aluminum foil. Uh, radio frequency electromagnetic radiation. And what you see here is uh, two of our instruments. These are the time of flight neutron detectors. And these are extremely sensitive electronic instruments that can detect individual particles by converting them into tiny bursts of light that are uh, tremendously amplified. And these instruments that have been around for, I don't know, 50 or 60 years uh, are one of the ways that we know that we're getting extremely high uh, temperatures. And I can illustrate that. We'll sit back down. Okay. And these are the time of flight uh, raw data. This is from the near time of flight and this green one is from the far time of flight. And these are the X-ray pulses. They arrive at the speed of light and they're superimposed. We've superimposed this for timing. These are the neutrons. They travel much more slowly. And what you see is that this is the near time of flight, this is the far time of flight. The neutron pulse is spread out. And that spreading is because the neutrons are produced by ions that themselves have high velocity. So when these two velocities are, are added together, there's a spread in velocity. And the time, the time differences in the time of arrival increases as you increase in distance. So um, what you get here, if you superimpose these, curves is this measure of the spreading. And from this measure of the spreading, we can directly mathematically get what the ion energy is. The more the spreading, the higher the temperature. And uh, as a matter of fact, we haven't fully analyzed it because it was just this morning. So it looks like we've achieved even higher temperatures in the shot that we took this morning. So why don't we go back to the questions? Yeah, fine. <clears throat> no, my, I uh, wrote to the question because we were thinking, or I was thinking that uh, there was going to be uh, a special uh, switch 
laser uh, ah. operated uh, I think diamond. I think. Uh, hmm. Is it uh, that uh, yet to come, or is it a technology that is not uh, suitable? Well, the diamond switches we were talking about, not for the experiment, but for the next phase of development in which we are taking energy out of the beam and putting it through, a, capturing it in the coil, and then putting it into the capacitors. We need very fast switches to be able to prevent that energy from flowing back into the beam as it exits. And we had written about diamond switches, which are based on illuminating diamond with a, a UV pulse. UV laser. A UV laser pulse makes it into a conductor. When you turn the laser off, diamond becomes what it is naturally, which is an extremely um, efficient insulator. That technology is not yet commercialized and if we are intending to use that as part of our uh, device in the development phase, we'll probably have to put several million dollars into the development of that switch because it is not yet commercialized and uh, so it's not something so we it's a stage yet, uh, it's a stage yet to come. Yes, that's a, definitely at the development stage. Uh, we'd get to that at the development stage, not the research stage. At the research stage, we're trying to use things that are already fully commercialized, which we thought included the switches we bought, but it turned out they weren't fully commercialized, and we had to do a lot of work to, uh, to get them to work correctly, which we've now completed. Okay, very good. Thanks very much for participating, and I hope you enjoyed our surprises.